friends, Dave Fuentes, k Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. And this is actually the first video that I'm putting up that I've made since I've been home from the premiere. So I wanted to give you a little bit of update on the movie. And uh, we had just about 300 people at the premiere in Arizona. It was a capacity crowd. And uh, I'm someone who's been in a lot of crowds, a lot of conferences, a lot of people. Let me tell you, I have never been around so many nice people in my life. And that was the same comment I got from everyone who was working the event, from my family to the people from Phoenix MUFON that helped us. Uh, unbelievable event. Um, couple of things. So this is a... Uh, Bigfoot 101 class. This is one of many that I'm going to do on this topic as we walk down the path that I walked. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. But getting back to the movie, uh, the video I put up before this was one that I took at the premiere. And I'll explain how this went. Uh, everyone arrived at the premiere and uh, you checked in we had a half an hour open bar and then we had a buffet dinner and then we had some a cake that was cut by Daniela Salman a lady who lost her husband in British Columbia that's in the movie uh, comments about the food were really good comments about the cake were good and then we went into the auditorium and saw the movie and then at the end of the movie, we took a half an hour break. And from there, we came back into the theater. And one of, there was a lot of important people in that theater that were way more important than me. And I was humbled that they were there. But one of the people that I'd gotten prior permission that I asked him if I could interview him on stage after the film was a man named Jonathan Dover from the Navajo Rangers. And Jonathan spent 31 years as a ranger for the Navajo Nation. And his job was to be essentially the ranger, wildlife ranger, livestock ranger for the tribe, along with uh, several other Navajo Rangers. Well, the tribe had a lot of sightings of UFOs, Bigfoot, paranormal, skinwalkers. The interview, and it's on my platform here, and it's the one right before this, is one where I sat down with Jonathan and talked about things related to the movie, talked about Bigfoot. And I've seen him on History Channel's Skinwalker show before. And he's extremely well-spoken, highly educated, went to the federal law enforcement training ses uh, session. He has a lot of tracking experience and he speaks openly and honestly, and he comes from a science and spiritual world, much as though Harvey Pratt did and does. One of the most enlightening interviews I've done in a long time and important interviews. In the last year, many of you have sent me emails, questions. Dave, what do you think about this person or what do you think about that person? And I don't comment on many of those. I just ignore them because if I don't have, my mom used to say, Dave, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. And I've said before, unless somebody attacks me, I'll defend myself, but I'm not going to proactively go out and destroy somebody. But I will say this, that there's somebody out there that says that they've been doing Bigfoot research for 20 years. He's somebody that's always on TV. He's never done a bit of research. He's never done anything, as far as I can tell, other than say whatever any producer or director wants him to say. And he's recently been saying that in his 20 or 30 years of doing Bigfoot research, 
that he's never run across anything paranormal, anything unusual, anything supernatural. <laughs> well, that's the most humorous thing I've ever heard. Because you can't be in this world without hearing things that are unusual, supernatural, bizarre. And probably the best validation point was Jonathan's interview. Um, if you haven't watched it, go back and watch it. But it, it falls right in line with the class I'm talking about. So one of the stories Jonathan talks about is, and I've heard him say this before, whereas he and his partner were out and they get a call about some unusual tracks and some Bigfoot activity. And he stated that the tribe classified Bigfoot as an animal, even though nobody in the tribe thinks it's an animal. But the tribe classifies it as that, and it goes to them to investigate. And he stated that he and his partner found some tracks, and they tracked him for quite a distance. And he's a professional tracker. He says, and all of a sudden, the tracks end. He goes, well, that's odd. So they decide to track backwards and see where the tracks came from. And as they track backwards, the tracks seem to start out of nothingness. <laughs> he said, wow, <laughs> that's pretty weird. Yeah, that's pretty weird. And I've stated before that's happened to me in Angie in Colorado. And I can tell you that it's happened to many other researchers as well. Here's an example. If you get somebody saying, hmm, I've never seen a deer in my life, and I've been on this earth for 50 years, well, is that possible? Well, I guess if you lived in New York City and you never had a television and you didn't wander out of a three block area of downtown metropolitan New York, Possible? The point being is that if you never go out into the field and you never talk to witnesses and you never go to locations where these things happen, it's never going to happen to you. You've got to get out into the environment. Now with Angie and I, I knew the area that we were going into. I told her that there's been a lot of weird things that have happened here. Um, and then subsequent to that, two times we were on that trail and things bizarrely happened. Another one that happened on that same trail, uh, we're walking along and this bird stayed within two or three feet of us for a two, two or three mile hike along the trail. And every time we would stop, the bird would stop right near us, look at us. Sometimes it would just stare and sometimes it would sing. And we both thought at the end, who is that bird? What is that bird? Because that bird is not normal. And then a story, uh, I'll tell you. Uh, I've, I've talked this before and it's directly related to Bigfoot. We we're in a Bigfoot area and uh, Angie was saying, hey Dave, you know, you watch these shows all the time where these people bang on the tree and make a lot of noise. I go, yeah, I don't believe in doing that. And she goes, hey, let's try it. I said, okay, we'll try it. So I get, it's actually pretty funny. I get on a big, there's this big piece of branch on the ground. And I crank up and I whack the side of this tree and the branch just explodes into a million pieces. It doesn't make any sound at all, hardly. And we both laughed. And uh, we're hiking out. We hike out about two or three miles. And the trail narrows and you have a cliff down to your left, down to the river. And you have uh, like a, a rocky very steep incline to your right. And as we come around this corner, right in the middle of this rocky trail is this absolutely straight piece of branch that's stuck in the ground, right in the middle of the ground. And we both stop. 
Actually, Angie walked past it and I go, whoa, come here. She goes, whoa, what's that? And all of the branches have been taken off and it looks like they've been taken off with either a fingernail or something sharp. It's a very smooth, very straight. It's about eight feet tall and it's sticking right into this ground that there's no way I could, I could get anything into this ground because of the rocks and the, how tough the ground is. I took the, I took that. And Angie said, right away, Dave, I think somebody's gifting you that so you can go hit a tree. I go, I don't know. We still have that stick to this day. The point being, and this is the same trail where we saw the tracks coming down in front of us that stopped next to the river. The point being, if you never look for something, if you're never in the area, if you don't try, it's never going to happen to you. But for somebody to say and force his views on others that this is just ridiculous and this doesn't ever happen, I have a very difficult time with that person. And that's unfortunate. <clears throat> but catching us up to date on classroom activity. So we went through uh, Bigfoot, Wild Men, and Giants, my book. I read you a series of stories out of there. And then I, we talked about some incidents that happened decades ago in Canada and the U.S. And we talked about the Patterson-Gimlin film that I talked, showed you some pictures. And we come to this point where I went out into the field in Hoopa. And I started to f my trek to figure out how was I going to find credible people in the community to talk to about this? Well, this is the first book I ever wrote, The Hoopa Project. The Hoopa Project is printed by Hancock House Publishing. I self-publish all of the missing 411 books. When I was a young, not too smart author, I thought, oh, how cool would that be to get somebody to publish my books? Well, Hancock House took it right away when I came with the manuscript. And it's always cool to say, oh, you're a published author. Oh my gosh. Well, I went with Hancock House for two books, this book and Tribal Bigfoot. And they still published the books. And they went out, and without my permission, but they didn't need it because they're the publisher, they also published these two books in ebooks. Now, I sell both books myself online, but those are the only two books that I've authored that are ebooks. And again, I don't have any control over that, that's their control. But the Hoopa Project was an effort on my part to explain the path I took once I got in Hoopa. Again, Hoopa is a Native American reservation in Humboldt County, California, inland from the Pacific Ocean on the Trinity River. The Trinity River in Northern California is a very famous fishery with great steelhead and salmon fish. It's, it's the best. I fished it, one of the biggest fish I ever hooked in my life. I fought for an hour and I lost it. I have no idea how big it was, but it, it had to be huge. So I'm gonna walk you down this path again, starting with some things right out of my book. Since it's my book, I can do whatever I want with it. And I'm going to start off by saying I was looking for validation from a government entity that Bigfoot was real. And on page 17, what I talk about is, I'll read it to you, it says, the United States Army Corps of Engineers is made up of approximately 34,600 civilian 
and 650 military men and women. It says, our military and civilian engineers, scientists, and other specialists work hand in hand and as leaders in engineering and environmental matters. Our diverse workforce of biologists, engineers, geologists, and hydrologists, natural resource managers, and other professionals meet the demands of the changing times and requirements as a vital part of America's Army. That's from the, Ar uh, the, that's the Army Corps of Engineers website. Following paragraph, in the realm of Bigfoot research, we are always looking for credible validation of beliefs. The idea that Bigfoot exists is always the number one issue that we are reaching for and attempting to document. In my personal research of the United States government records to acknowledge publicly the issue of Bigfoot, I was successful. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers authored an atlas in 1975 on the state of Washington. The atlas encompassed a variety of topics in which the Corps has expertise. Many of the problems that the Corps covers represents issues and barriers that may encounter en route to their mission. One portion of the atlas is a two-page report on Sasquatch. Did you know that? The narrative follows. Sasquatch, the very existence of Sasquatch Bigfoot, as it is sometimes known, is hotly disputed. Some profess to be open-minded about the matter, although stating that not one piece of evidence will withstand serious scientific scrutiny. Others, because of a particularly incident or totality of the reports over the years, are convinced that Sasquatch is a reality. Alleged Sasquatch hair samples inspected by FBI laboratories resulted in the conclusion that no such hair exists on any human or presently known animal for which data are available. And that is true. This part is true. That Sasquatch hair is unique. That part is 100% true. Information from alleged sightings, tracks, and other experiences conjures up that picture of an ape-like creature standing between 8 and 12 feet tall, weighing in excess of 1,000 pounds, and taking strides up to 6 feet. Remember, this is a government document. Plaster casts have been made of tracks showing a large squarish foot, not rectangular foot, but it says squarish in the documents, 14 to 24 inches long, 5 to 10 inches in breadth, reported to feed on vegetation and some meat. The Sasquatch is covered with long hair except, except the face and hands. Thank you. And has a distinctly human-like form. Sasquatch is very agile and powerful with the endurance to cover a vast range in search of food, shelter, and other of its kind. It is apparently able to see at night and is extremely shy, leaving minimal evidence of its presence. Tracks are presently the best evidence of the existence. A short film of an alleged female Sasquatch was shot in Northern California, which, although scoffed at, shows no signs of fabrication. It's a patterson Gilman film. The Pacific Northwest is generally considered to be the hotbed of Sasquatch activity, with Washington leading in numbers of reports and tracks or sightings since 68. However, reports of Sasquatch-like creatures are known from as far as the Parmere Mountains in USSR and South America. If Sasquatch is purely legendary, the legend is likely to be a long time dying. On the other hand, if Sasquatch does exist, then with the Sasquatch hunts being mounted and the increasing human population, it seems likely that some hard evidence may soon be at hand. Legendary or actual, Sasquatch excites the great popular interest of Washington, 1975, Army Corps of Engineers, Washington Atlas. When I first saw that, I thought, wow, <laughs> a government entity was allowed to write this, put it down, that'll be permanently viewed, and what they said is true. They didn't lie. It also shows a map of locations and a small drawing of a Sasquatch. If you Google it, you'll be able to find it. So, in it, it shows a British Columbia had 38 tracks, Washington 32, Oregon 15, California 82. Sightings, British Columbia 80, Washington 51, Oregon 25, California 59. Now, in the book, I talk about a place called Skamania County, Washington. This is what I said. Skamania is located in the state of Washington, approximately 60 miles east of Vancouver, Washington, at the mouth of the Columbia River Gorge. The area is extremely rural, with the Gifford Peenshot National Forest to the north and Mount Hood National Forest to the south. 
The county has a population of 10,664 in 2005, with 1,672 square miles. Largest city in Skamania County is Stevenson with a population of 1,200. The county received national recognition in 1969 when the county commissioners received several reports of Bigfoot sightings. The commissioners, the commissioners became concerned and believed that there was a creature matching Bif Bigfoot's description and lived in the rural sections of the county. Their concern prompted the council to enact Legislation Ordinance 69-01. The first document listed in the following pages is the first piece of legislation that was passed in 69. In summary, the council states, there's evidence to indicate the possible existence in Skamania County of a nocturnal, nocturnal primate mammal. That was the end of the quotes. This is a monumental declaration for a legislative body to state. In 84, Skamania County opted to update their Bigfoot legislation adopted in 69. It was extensive. The legislation went from one to three pages. The most interesting part said, should the Skamania County coroner determine any victim creature to have been humanoid, the prosecuting attorney shall pursue the case under existing law pertaining to homicide. So let's get that right. Somebody out there kills a Bigfoot and they do the DNA like we've already done the DNA and it already comes back as human, they're going to charge you with murder. Perfect. A county in the U.S. of America is so concerned about the welfare of the creature that science will not acknowledge it exists, that it enacts legislation addressing the point of killing a human versus an anthropoid. Fascinating in my view. Also, a, uh, I did a search and Whatcom County, Washington also came up. Uh, Whatcom is in the north westernmost county in the state and sits adjacent to the Canadian border. The county has a population of 183,000, land mass of 2,119 square miles. The county seat is Bellingham with a population of 61,000. Whatcom has a designation as a national scenic byway from Bellingham to Mount Baker. There are locations of Whatcom County in the Mount Baker region and are extensively rural. In 92, the county received national prominence when their council enacted legislation defining the county as a Sasquatch protection and refuge area. Did you know that? So I'm, I'm marching you down the path of validation. Again, all of these things are fact. Legislation has been passed. This is the date of the bill. A check of Bigfoot Internet databases lists 40 sightings in Whatcom County which makes it ranked 8th in the Washington County list for the most Sasquatch sounding. Five of the sightings listed on the site are near Mount Baker, Lake Baker. The years of the sighting have been reported in a range from 72 to 2005. Whatcom County did not list any penalties for violating the legislation, and the language in the bill is very limited as compared to Skamania County's bill. Whatcom County has not amended or repealed the legislation, and it still stands as county law. Now what happened was, is I called Whatcom County and asked for a copy of their legislation. And the court clerk there said, Dave, I've been here 20 years, nobody's ever asked for it. I'll get you a certified copy. And she did, such a nice person. And the certified copy is in the book, explains the legislation and again, I'm, I'm doing this because I want you to follow my path. So, when I start to get to the point of figuring out where I'm going to be, I knew Skamania County was a hotbed of activity. And I knew Humboldt County was a place I wanted to go because of Hoopa. So what I did is I wrote a section in here comparing Skamania and Humboldt counties. Both counties border large bodies of water. Skamania, the Columbia River, and Humboldt. Pacific Ocean, with six separate large rivers in Humboldt County. Both counties have a great amount of rainfall, from 30 inches in some areas to 90 inches in the other. 
The government is the largest employer in each county. Both counties had a flourishing timber industry in years past and now they are struggling. Portions of each county sit at sea level. Humboldt bordering the Pacific Ocean, Skamania bordering the Columbia River, which is essentially at sea level. Both counties have gently sloping hillsides, steep and rugged mountains that receive snowfall annually and have regions in their county that have been heavily forested. Both counties have remote areas that are rarely visited, are rugged, and are dangerous to travel. So I'm at this point, I've done all this research, I'm sitting in a room. The decision. After accumulating all the listed data that I had the decision almost to whether to dedicate my time to one specific region, Humboldt County jumped out at me as a strong location to start for the research. Hoopa seemed to be a natural location set up at my office to hang a shingle and it was a valley of all the amenities of home. There was a base of population that had a heritage linked to the area for almost 200 years. The climate of the Hoopa Valley matched the areas outlined as having a high incidence of Bigfoot activity. The tribe had established residence there for hundreds and hundreds of years. There was a large body of water associated with the valley, the Trinity River. The area also comes with an interesting history, a reservation and a region that is almost completely surrounded by wilderness areas that being the Trinity Alps and the Marble Mountain Wilderness Area, a national park, Redwood National Park, and the United States Forest property. The rainfall, climate, and characteristics of the surrounding environment make Hoopa a great opportunity for spending a significant amount of time understanding and researching Bigfoot. Is it coincidence that the purported Bigfoot capital of the world, Willow Creek, is 14 miles south of Hoopa? It is also a bonus that the most famous film footage in the world, the Patterson-Gimlin, was shot just north of the reservation boundary at Bluff Creek. Now you know how I got to Hoopa. So, I get to Hoopa. And my first contacts. This is important. I knew that Hoopa had their own tribal police department and they were duly authorized and sworn as Humboldt County Sheriffs. I always get along with cops, deputies, they're good people. And I got there and this is what happened. On my first night in Hoopa, I found two tribal police officers parked next to the only gas station in town. They were talking to each other in separate police vehicles. I drove up in my car parked and walked up to an officer. I explained why I was in town looking for people who have witnessed Bigfoot and asked if he could shed any light on the issue. This officer was raised in the Hoopa area and is a native Indian. He stated that the Hoopa people believe in Bigfoot and that it lives in the trees, similar to what we saw in the movie Predator. He said that they believe that it lives in the middle zone between both dimensions and can travel between them. Bingo! Remember somebody said, oh my, here's a Bigfoot, I've never heard anything unusual. My first contact with a police officer, and this is what I'm told. You with me? A, a police officer that his family has lived in the area for generations, experienced the biped for generations. How can you ignore this? You say that they believe Bigfoot should be left alone. Don't bother it and it won't bother you. Stated that 30 years ago, there was a story that a woman who lived in the mountains between Hoopa and Willow Creek had found and kept a Bigfoot male child. The story goes that she raised it into its teens. It never went to school and just stayed at the house. He stated that it had hair over its entire body and never spoke to anyone. He said that when the woman died, the male creature escaped into the hills and was never seen again. His only personal incident involving Bigfoot was when he was 12 years old. He said he was hunting in the area with other family members when they were setting up camp. They forgot some items in their car and he volunteered to go back alone and retrieve them. Point of separation, remember that. Carrying his rifle with him, he said that he reached the car, he heard something strange and he froze. He notes that Native Americans are always taught that when you hear anything strange or see anything strange, you should immediately freeze. He heard a loud and solid thump, thump, approximately 30 feet from where he was standing. 
He maintains that it was so solid that the earth almost shook. The footsteps stopped and he felt as though something or someone was watching him. He grabbed what he needed and made a dash back to the camp, thinking that maybe one of his family members was playing a trick on him. He stated when he fam finally got back to the group, he found them all there and there was no prank. The other officer I met that first day in town also grew up in Hoopa and has stories about Bigfoot. He said that he has talked to many people over the years that have seen Bigfoot on the roads leaving Hoopa, usually in the late afternoon and evening. He related how a friend had told him that he was driving up a local road when around a turn and saw Bigfoot kneeling in the middle of the road. He told me that I should meet, and he pointed to a house down the road, and he said I should go there and talk to the person. He said another friend, she heard a noise at the side of her house near her garbage cans and went to investigate. She saw a Bigfoot reaching over her shed and the two huge arms pulling the bags of garbage over the fence. When she yelled, the Bigfoot turned and fled. He said that there were dirt handprints on the bags and they were shown to neighbors. He told me that he would contact his, this individual to see if she would talk to me. I was later put in contact with her and a lengthy story is in this book along with the sketch by Harvey Pratt. That story is riveting. And why is it riveting? Because this woman had a motion camera on the side of her house. And they had a garbage area where they put their garbage bags in this white tin shed that was open and it was overflowing with garbage. And she, the motion light went off. And her house was right at the edge of the national, uh, the forest for the tribal area. And there was a lot of problem with bears. Lots of bears in Hoopa. Lots of bears. More bears per capita per square mile than anywhere else in California. And I knew that because I talked to the tribal biologist. So when lights go off, she would go out and make a lot of noise, scare the black bear away. But anyhow, she goes out and she sees something on two feet, standing, leaning over this tin shed door. And it appeared to be pushing bags of garbage out of the way. And she said, well, she's lived there her whole life. She knows she's looking at a Bigfoot. So she has her phone, she calls tribal police, and she says, hey, I've got someone here going through my garbage, I need help. So they send two police officers. Well, she sees this thing pushing garbage, away, garbage around and then grab two bags of garbage. Think about that. For something to grab a bag of garbage it has to have hands. So it grabs two bags of garbage turns and walks towards the forest. And she said that the back of this thing was humongous, muscly, ripped, uh, was extremely tall. And it's walking to the forest just as the police officers are driving up. So I asked her, I said, so why would it be going through your garbage? And she said the only thing she could think of is that she was on her period and there were tampons in the garbage. And she said maybe he was looking for those or she couldn't quite make it, but she said it's never happened before and it never happened since. Now, one of the police officers that responded there, they put me in contact with him. And I've told the story before that when he got out of his car, he said he could feel the earth shake from the footsteps of the biped. That's how serious it was. And he said when he walked into the woods, it was jet black. He didn't see anything. And it's like it cleared the force just as he drove up. And he said that he had a canine in the car with him, but he didn't take the dog out. And the dog was not making a sound in the car. And usually when you roll up on a call like that, the canines are just ready to go for the car, for the dog just to sit there and make no other sound. The officer knew it was something strange. And that's why he didn't bring the dog out. 
went out, looked around a little bit. He says, no, Dave, I didn't make a huge effort because I knew what we were looking for. And uh, didn't smell anything. Came back, talked to the woman. And the important part of all this is where that Bigfoot was leaning over those tin doors. And he pulled back the bags right on the corner there was a clump of hair that was pulled off by that door. I got that hair. And uh, that was part of the original submission of hair uh, in the Bigfoot DNA project. And it did come back highly unique, unknown, no mammal in that area, not a human hair, totally, totally unique. Bigfoot. I'm going to show you a picture of a man that I have a lot of reverence for. Not only because he worked for the Forest Service and one of the very few honest Forest Service biologists I've ever met, but because Tony Hacking died shortly after I met him. Let me show you the one picture in the book. I'm uh, Tony Hacking, U.S. Forest Service biologist working out of the Orleans office. So, I'm in Bigfoot. <laughs> I'm in Hoopa. And I wanted to get some Forest Service maps, because they're really good. So I went to the Orleans office, and I walked in, stated that I wanted the maps, and I asked them if the house biologist, regional biologist was in. They said, yeah. I said, can I talk to him? They said, sure. And Tony came out. I've met a lot of biologists. I would say, unfortunately, many of them are not very nice people. It's their information. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want anything to do with you. And they will not talk about Bigfoot. They make fun of it. They make, they'll make fun of you. This... It was almost like I was, I was blessed that day because I was brand new to the topic. I was brand new in the area. This was the first week I was there and I was just trying to touch the bases on the periphery before I started really honing in on what I wanted to do. So, this is how the story goes. On my second day in the Hoopa area, I decided to meet with a staff biologist for the Bluff Creek region surrounding Hoopa and the Six Rivers National Forest, Tony Hacking. I went, met with Tony at his business office in Orleans. Tony told me that he had been assigned to the go-to person on all issues regarding Bigfoot. He stated that his supervisor is a district ranger, and he believes that as long as it brings recreation and interest to the district, he is for him spending time on the subject. An absolutely unbelievable positive attitude about the topic. I've never heard that type of attitude anywhere else. I should state here that this is an unusual position for the U.S. Forest Service to take. Most supervisors refuse to talk about Bigfoot and won't allow their subordinates to talk about anything related to the topic. Tony stated that he was recently highlighted on a Travel Channel special about Bigfoot and was asked to give his expert opinion and enlighten America on the topic. He took the crew to the original site of the Patterson-Gimlin footage he said that it was quite unique and quite a challenge to find the site and then to positively identify it was even more of a challenge. He said that they confirmed that the sighting was finding a pyramid shaped rock that was in the original clip, but that the entire basin has changed dramatically. Tony explains that he wants to be a Bigfoot believer and that his position is enthusiastically optimistic. Those were his words, enthusiastically optimistic. He stated he knows about the dermal ridges in foot castings the unknown determination of DNA analysis, and the enormous, enormous number of stories that proliferate throughout the region. He said that he is the only government biologist anywhere in the basin, and he is covering two different offices. He said there is supposed to be a position in handicap, uh, handicap, <laughs> happy camp, but the Forest Service has not filled it. Hacking said that many people who see Bigfoot are reluctant to talk 
about the experience for fear of ridicule. Local residents usually direct witnesses to his location for documentation and wildlife identification. He does state that he tries to find a rational explanation for the sighting that is reported, but sometimes it cannot be explained. He said the administrators inside their office have refused to expend research dollars on the Bigfoot issue. He explains that his position doesn't do research, it's more about wildlife management. The researchers are in Eureka and they don't or won't work Bigfoot related issues. Tony's job requires that he is in the field the majority of the time doing studies on a variety of wildlife management problems. He said that whenever he is out in the field, he's always looking for evidence of Bigfoot. And this is what, during the conversation, I kind of made this flow, but it's more of a give and take in the conversation. And I'm asking him, has he ever seen any evidence in the field of Bigfoot? And this is where it goes. One piece of evidence that people don't usually search for is wildlife paths that have a height clearing over seven feet. He points out that most animals that walk trails need a maximum height of five feet to cleanly walk day in and day out. He was recently working in Blue Creek Trail drainage area and was walking a wildlife path, wildlife path when he realized he was walking in heavy foliage that had over a seven foot height clearing. He found that highly unusual for a desolate area and region. Tony claimed that this is one time in his career that he felt he might be walking on a Bigfoot path. So, Blue Creek, I spent a lot of time in that area. Spooky. <laughs> That's all I could say. It was a heck of an effort to get in, a heck of an effort to get out. Nobody went in there. Spooky. I probably spent several weeks in that area in the two years I was there. In the same general area of the main section of Blue Creek, a U.S. Forest Service employee working as a special project for the Yurok Fisheries came into his office claiming he found a Bigfoot bed. He told them that they were in the region doing special environmental studies when he was following the main segment of Blue Creek. Just up one small hill from the creek, he found bedding material, straw, dried grass, leaves, etc., that had been piled together in a deliberate attempt to make a bed. He also stated that there were bones lying on the ground immediately adjacent to the bed. He took a photo of the accum accumulation and showed it to Tony. Tony told me that the photo was a little too grainy for positive ID, but that it was always possibility Bigfoot was involved. The statement regarding the bedding does fall into a category of sightings made by other individuals about possible Bigfoot sleeping areas. Many times the beds are directly above or near a river or creek and are associated with dry foliage, bones are sometimes found in the area. Tony did point out that some cougars have similar bedding to raise, or raise and harbor their young. The site the U.S. Forest Service employee found was much larger than a normal cougar bed lion area. I asked Tony to give his best guess of where he would set up a study for the environmental and physical study of Bigfoot. You gotta, you gotta remember, guys and ladies. My meeting with Tony was one in a hundred thousand. Nobody in the Forest Service is like this. And honestly, when I heard he died, I was so sad. Some people had told me that he had cancer and that he wasn't doing well. I saw him one time, and then a couple of years later, I heard he died. I know he had a wife, and I feel very, very bad for his family. He was a good, good soul. So he said that he would drive to the end of the Go Road, that's Icy Road. That's exactly where the Patterson Gimlin feature was filmed off of. Knowing that it takes approximately one hour to drive all the way to the end, he said that if you go to the northeast, it drops into the Dillon Creek Basin, and the other direction goes into Fish Lake and Bluff Creek. Both areas are extremely desolate, with few people traveling into the region. He said that Upper Blue Creek near the Bluff Creek region would be an excellent choice. Near the end of the meeting, Tony told me of a telephone call he received after the airing of the Bigfoot special on the Travel Channel. It was from a female archaeologist from the U.S. Forest Service Plumas Division. She had discovered a petroglyph painted by Indians which appeared to be several hundred years old. She had come out and publicly stated that one of the drawings was of a Bigfoot. She was ridiculed and restricted by her supervisors from ever saying anything publicly 
about what she had found. She was surprised that Tony's supervisors had allowed him to show publicly on television in his uniform speaking about the Bigfoot phenomena. Tony said that he felt fortunate to have the subtle support of his supervisors on the Bigfoot issue. I invited Tony to join me at a local restaurant for lunch and he obliged. We spent approximately four hours talking about Bigfoot. He invited me back for a second meeting the following morning and at 10 o'clock in his office. He stated that he would go over maps of the surrounding area and further explain sighting locations. The next day, Tony supplied me with the needed info to physically inspect several areas of interest. Sadly, Tony passed away in early 2007, leaving behind a wife and her children. Yeah. The Bigfoot world is very strange, folks. Very strange. The deaths of some people, the knowledge. I thought it was just so weird that somebody who had this knowledge, that had an open mind, would pass away. I, I thought about it a long time. God bless you, Tony. Thank you for your time. So, one of the other peripheral items that the natives talked about incessantly, and Harvey Pratt talks about it, is something called little people. Little people are essentially little tiny, look like humans. They dress sometimes like leprechauns. They wear strange clothes. They're described as being as fierce as an eight foot, 300 pound man. And I've been told that they live underground, sometimes in the trunks of trees. Well, I was in the Karuk tribal offices and Karuk tribal offices are very near the border of Hoopa. And I asked them to explain what little people wore. They looked at each other with, this is what I wrote in the book, with stern expressions and said they were told by tribal elders that they were not to talk about this. I explained that I did not want to betray their tribal beliefs or customs or to compromise their personal religious beliefs, but that I knew many people were interested. They thanked me and said that they could talk minimally about it. I expressed gratitude and said that if I asked an inappropriate question, I apologize in advance and asked for their forgiveness. I did ask them why there was a veil of secrecy about little people. Both stated that all their people came from the little people. That is where their religious beliefs come from and where their genetic start was located. They both stated that theirs was the first tribe in the region. Both confirmed that medicine people inside the tribe still have contact with little people. They are nearby mystical mountains and caves that are sacred and their locations where the little people live and where they came from. Their locations are hidden and secret. Both agreed that they could not state where these mountains are located. I asked them if there was a doctrine or a Bible for their tribe, and they said that there was not. They state that their tribe controls 1.4 million acres, and they believe that their God gave them hands to help nature. They believe that they were the first people in the United States. They stated that their main source of income for the tribe was grants from the U.S. government. Approximately 30 minutes into the discussion, I thanked both men and their time and told them that I truly appreciated their outlook and explanation of their tribal beliefs. Important, folks. When you step into somebody's home, you treat that home with respect and dignity. I don't care what you think of those people. They're inviting you in. You respect them. <clears throat> I learned that a long time ago. And that's always been my belief. And every time I went onto a reservation, and I've been on a dozen, I'd say probably 20 different ones, always respectful, always appreciated the conversation. And I've never made fun of any belief of a Native American. It's something that's passed down elder to elder. I think we could learn a lot by many of their beliefs. Now, in talking to several witnesses, a question that came up was food sources. Now one thing that just blows you away is when you're driving down right through Hoopa on the main highway, there's berries everywhere. 
And right from the get-go, I said, I know why there's so many bears, and I know why there's so many Bigfoot sightings. There's berries everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Same with the Go Road. So berries were one of the first things that broached that topic. Now bears, one of the correlations I made was where there were a lot of bears, there's a good chance there were a lot of Bigfoot in this area. That's what I wrote. According to the U.S. Forest Service, there are approximately 600,000 black bears in the U.S. These bears range from 100 to 200 pounds for females, 350 to 700 pounds for males, with the average male 400 pounds. The black bear can live 30 years, if not under hunting pressure. The Forest Service states that under the best estimates, there are 20,000 to 24,000 black bears in California. The bears have a history of eating grasses and berries and feed off the skills of other animals. Black bears have also been known to take down small deer, although it's rare. Koopa had a biologist for the tribe, a couple of great people, and they had collars, on a, tracking collars on a lot of bears. And they said, Dave, interesting point about the bears here, they won't cross the Trinity River. A lot of people think, oh yeah, bear cross the river, do this, not in Hoopa. The biologist specifically said he's been there for 12 years. We haven't had one bear across that river. And he showed me a tracking map that they had of <clears throat> where the bears were at. He said, this is a biologist for Hoopa, the best bear consensus estimates that they possessed stated that there were 400 to 600 black bears on the reservation for 144 square miles. Essentially 12 miles by 12 miles. 400 to 600 bears. When I was there, I lost track of how many bears I saw. I saw them all the time. There was one time where I was going down to the Trinity River to get a picture. I was at my gun on me. And as I'm walking down, two bears passed me. One bear passed right in front of me five feet. Wasn't that big, didn't scare me. Another one came, came down the trail, it passed me and kept going towards the river. They were so human acclimated because they knew they were safe there. Native Americans would never, the Hoopa Native Americans would never hunt a black bear. Why? Because when you skin out a black bear, it looks like a human. It's very weird. I asked Mark, uh, he was a biologist at the time, about the rumors that I heard that the bears in the valley, Hoopa Valley, do not hibernate, if it was true. He straight stated that the healthiest bears do hibernate and the females that are pregnant must hibernate. He stated that the biggest bear they had ever captured was 400 pounds, but they do get larger. The bears in the valley may den only a few months. If the food source is available year round, they may not den at all. And the food sources are in April, acorns left over from the earlier season. In July, berries, cherries, plums, apples, anything from fruit trees, Year-round fish from tribal members' nets, which they'll go into the river and take. And they learned from watching the fishermen, the biologist believed. And he said it's been learned over the years. So, by talking to the biologists and understanding the behavior of the bears, I needed to know, was I going to be safe out there? And if I wasn't going to be, where should I stay away? And they stated that an attack by a black bear in Hoopa was outrageously, unbelievably rare. And uh, just stay away from them. Yeah, a lot of times they'll walk right by you like you're another bear. And uh, it made me feel a lot more comfortable. And then in the book, what I did is I evaluated the data coming from the California fishing game about bears killed, number of bears in the county, and I did a comparison. And then the number of bears that were likely still alive, <coughs> and then I mapped it next to it 
with Bigfoot sightings. So in Trinity County, which is right next to where I was, they had 10 Bigfoot sightings. Siskiyou County, again, next to us, 13 sightings. Shasta County, 10. Humboldt County, where I was, 28 Bigfoot sightings. And then four in Mendocino, eight in Tulare, six in Fresno, four in Plumas. So this was important. The most bears that were killed, Trinity County had 2,015 bears killed over the years. But the sightings and the bears all led up to an understanding of where I needed to go. Bears will hang out where there is food. The food that the bear are eating, it was the belief of everyone in Hoopa that that's the food that the Bigfoot also ate. So that's where I started. I had already made contact with the police officers. I had already interviewed them. I had asked for them to put me in contact with credible elders, and I'd like to interview them. And right away, there was camaraderie. And right away, I got their assistance. I was very blessed. And after my meeting with Tony from the Forest Service, I was a lot more optimistic that things were going to go well. I knew I was in the right place. I knew I had done my homework. I had my background done. I knew the areas I wanted to go to. I had people looking for witnesses for me, the police officers. And I was in the backyard where the Patterson Gimlin film was made. So that's where I'm going to stop for right now on the Hoopa project. We'll pick it up again next week. But if you're going to go into an area, don't go in like a fool. You got to go in and do your homework. How do you know there isn't a rogue bear in the area that's already attacked somebody? How do you know that there's a series of mountain lion attacks? How do you know that there isn't somebody hoaxing people by doing stupid stuff in the, in the outdoors? Until you go in and you start to make that effort, just like I explained, you don't know. So, I'm humbled that you're here. Thank you. This class was about going into the field and doing the hard work. It may seem unimportant, but it's hugely important. And if you want to take yourself and be credible, then do the work that may seem mundane and boring. But you've got to do it. Thanks for being with us. Make sure to watch that video of Jonathan Dover from the Navajo Rangers. And we'll be back with another class next week. This has been a Huck production. Huck's outside taking a nap, so thanks. Politis out.